I'll talk about the evidence landscape around the CAS-1 and also about our own experiences of the system. And I must say, it's great to be able to do so in real life and not online anymore. Uh, I have nothing to declare. Over the last decade, Danderyd has grown to become a high volume ablation center and the largest in Sweden. And uh, the liver ablations constitute the bulk of our production, but we also treat kidneys and lung tumors. And uh, even though my focus today will be on liver ablations, we have done more than 130 lung tumors, all with the use of the CAS-1. But today, liver, as I said, and um, of course, HCC is the most common diagnosis, as ablation is in the guidelines for HCC. And we do a lot of colorectal metastases as well, and quite a few net metastases. Not as a curative treatment, but for debulking and for symptomatic re relief. And we do some other diagnosis as well, usually when there is nothing else to be done. And uh, to target those liver tumors, we use the CAS1 in 75% of cases as of today. We still use ultrasound, usually with fusion, for around 20% of our cases and 5% are done laparoscopically in the OR. And uh, these are not yet published data, but we looked at tumors targeted to be uh, ablated with uh, stereotactic CT navigation with the CAS1, and we did an ultrasound to see if the tumor could be detected and ablated with ultrasound. And basically, this was to see if we really do need the CAS1 system. And in 26% of those tumors, we didn't need the CAS1. We could have ablated them with ultrasound as well. 33% would have been very difficult to ablate with ultrasound. And as many as 41% of those tumors were not detectable by ultrasound or could not be reached by ultrasound. So I think we do need the CAS1. And there is evidence for this system, quite a few publications during recent years, um, over 25 since 2011, and I will go into some detail for some of those studies. This is a paper we published in 2019 where we went through our first 1,000 ablation cases in Dandrid. And those were all types of tumors and all types of um, image guidance, but for 374 sessions, we used the CAS-1. And all modalities for ablation we use, but the vast majority we treat with microwave ablation. We don't do RFA anymore, so it's mainly microwaves. And the end point for this study was local recurrence rate at six months, and uh, local recurrence defined as detection of tumor within 10 millimeters from the ablation zone. So what did we find? Well, we found that with the introduction of ultrasound with fusion, it's important, we used to do only ultrasound-guided ablations, but with the introduction of ultrasound with fusion and, of course, stereotactic navigation with the CAS-1, our local recurrence rate went down to acceptable levels from 30% to around 10%, which is in agreement with the literature. And of course, that is the same as improved oncological outcome. We also found that when you have a good working setup, in our case, jet ventilation and experienced staff, it's quite easy to introduce new colleagues to this system. And once you've learned, it's operator independent, which is not the case for ultrasound, for example. And along with the literature again, we had a low rate of serious complications. This was another study in the same year, 2019, from Bern, and it looked at stereotactic navigation of HCC with the CAS1, a total of 174 tumors. And endpoints were local tumor control and short time survival. And uh, in this study, no location was too difficult. As you can see, they treated tumors in all segments of the liver, 
and also in challenging locations such as close to the heart, close to the gallbladder, close to major vessels and so on. And in spite of this, they had 88 complete ablations at three months, which is really good. And it was made even better with some reablations, uh, adding up to 96.3%. And it was safe to ablate in all different locations of the liver. And I think that if we have done this study in Dandrid, we would have set, had the same results because we also have the experience that with the use of CAS1, the location of the tumor is of minor importance. So this is a clinical case from our, from Dandrid, and HCC really high up in segment eight of the liver. And this is actually a patient from the previously mentioned study. This tumor could not at all be detected by ultrasound, as you can probably understand, but it could easily be ablated with a CAS1. And this is post-ablative imaging, and you can see the ablation zone covering the tumor and no signs of complications. And this is just to show you the antenna in place in a quite steep trajectory behind the rib cage, which of course would have been difficult with ultrasound. Uh, let's talk about IRE and uh, the CAS1. And as you know, if you do IRE, you need at least two electrodes, usually more. And those electrodes have to be placed around the tumor, uh, parallel to each other and at the same depth. And that is challenging, despite the navigation system you use. But at least with the CAS1, you get the opportunity to plan in advance the trajectories before you start placing the electrodes. And this study by Bayer looked at uh, IRE of malignant liver tumors, and uh, it was a prospective non-randomized study with 10 cases where the electrodes were placed with conventional CT fluoroscopy and 10 cases where the electrodes were placed with stereotactic CT navigation with the CAS1. And endpoints were time and radiation dose. Another IRE study by Dr. Stilström, who is a surgeon in Danderyd, he looked at all our cases, all our IRE treatments of liver tumors up until the last of December 2018, and um, in all 84 tumors. And endpoints, or what he analyzed, was accuracy and parallelism of those electrodes. Bayer found that the time it took to do an IRE was really reduced with the use of the CAS1. So even though it took some time to plan the trajectories and the, the placement of the electrodes in the CAS1 group, uh, it was so much faster to place the electrodes with help of the system, so it saved a lot of time. Uh, and also, of course, the radiation dose was, um, was reduced in the CAS1 group, and both studies found high parallelism between electrodes. And we would not perform IRE without the CAS1 today, and we have a study to prove it. It's uh, the same Dr. Stilström, and I'm not going into de this in any detail, but he had us place four IRE electrodes around lesions of a phantom, either with the CAS1 or ultrasound. And uh, he analyzed this, and median deviation and mean angle between electrodes were significantly better in the CAS1 group. This is again a real case from our clinical practice with five IRE electrodes placed around a deep central tumor with the aid of the CAS1. And as you can see, the electrodes are quite parallel and at the same depth. Let's move on to the Maverick trial, which is close to my heart. This study is now finished and will probably be published later this year. And, uh, the aim of this study was to prove oncological non-inferiority of microwave ablation versus liver surgery for small colorectal liver mats. And uh, tumors that were suitable for both those treatments were assigned uh, microwave ablation with the CAS1 system. And we participated uh, along with Netherlands and Switzerland and the primary outcome was three years survival, but we still follow this cohort, so we have 
more data today. Um, the, to, to control, the control group consisted of uh, matched patients from the Swedish liver, liver registry um, subjected to liver resection during the inclusion period. And in Stockholm, we had so many cases that we were able to do pseudo-randomization. So on even calendar weeks, we included patients into the study, and they were treated by microwave ablation with a Cas1. And on uneven weeks, patients who met the inclusion criteria were instead re resected. So they constitute a control group. And this subgroup within the Maverick study it has been analyzed, it has been submitted, and it's now accepted, actually, since two days. So I didn't have time to change my presentation. Uh, but this slide shows overall survival between the two groups in this Stockholm cohort. And as you can see, the curves follow each other, so there was no significant difference in overall survival. However, there was a difference in total cost between the two groups. And the total cost was quite much higher in the resected group, around or not, but almost 30,000 US dollars. And that is in spite of the, uh, some of these um, uh, costs were higher for the ablated group, but what was really expensive, it's the inpatient admissions. And as you can see, it, it's quite much higher for the resected group. So you can have the same overall survival at a lower cost if you ablate instead of resecting selected patients with colorectal liver mets. So what's in the future? I want to mention the New Comet and the Acclaim study. New Comet is a Norwegian study where they are looking at ablation versus resection of colorectal liver mets. And um, the aim is to compare rates of local tumor progression within 12 months. And as you probably know, a lot of studies on ablation, there, there is a selection bias. But this study is actually designed to be a randomized trial. So patients are randomly assigned to either ablation or resection. Um, there are also a lot of other secondary endpoints, which include quality of life and cost assessments and so on and so forth, which is also really interesting. And we are going to include uh, in this study during this fall, hopefully, and Oslo had, had done around 44 patients by this summer. So it's up and running. And the acclaimed study out of Sloan Kettering, uh, they also look at uh, correct liver mets. And the aim is to demonstrate that microwave ablation will result in a two-year local progression-free survival of at least 90% if you have an ablation margin of at least 5 millimeters. So again, the, the mar margin is very important, but it's going to be interesting. So in conclusion, there are many, many studies supporting the use of the CAS1. And there is even an ongoing randomized study on ablation versus resection where ablation is done with the CAS1, and which is going to be really interesting to see. I forgot to mention they're actually going to try to keep it double-blinded for as long as possible with large dressings on the patients post-operatively. Um, in Dandryd, we have a long experience of the CAS1 by now, and we use it for around 75% of our liver ablations and for all lung ablations, as I said earlier. And um, in agreement with the literature, we find that location of tumor is of minor importance for technical success with the use of CAS1. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marie. Um, have you uh, an idea or numbers regarding how many patients you treat more with CAS1 with respect of not using it, um, roughly? Uh, I would think if you do not, uh, would not have CAS1, oh. how many or which could be the percentage of patients you would decline with, uh, with ablation? 
that is a very good question that I cannot really answer, but I do know that we get quite a few uh, referrals from other hospitals in Sweden where they cannot find the tumors with ultrasound or it's too difficult to do CT fluoroscopy and they send them to us so we can ablate with the use of CAS1. And in this not published study, at l almost half of those tumors we would have been we couldn't have treated. So it's, I would say it's quite a few. Of course, you can always, we have the systems, we will use it instead of risking a uh, maybe r risky ultrasound guided ablation, but, but I think we do need it. So the, in your study, there were all consecutive patients, actually. You yes, didn't it was. Decline. If mm -hmm. you consider an intention to treat basis, they were all treated. Yes, we, we had all the the... They were already prioritized to do the ablation with the Cas1 because of the location of the tumor, okay. basically. And we just then looked at the same tumor with ultrasound to see if we could have used it instead. And for what 41%, we couldn't. Thank you very much. There is another question from the floor. Uh, you already mentioned, but it is worthwhile to repeat. Has the system been validated for renal or lung ablation? For renal kidney oh, or lung? yes, it is used for renal ablations. We tried that early days. Um, it was difficult then, but I was not around, so I haven't tried it myself. But I've heard now that in Zurich, for example, they use it for renal ablations. The problem with ren with the kidneys, as you know, is that they are really m mobile. So. The problem with the CAS where you want everything to stay as still as possible during the whole procedure, and then you come with your ablation antenna and the kidney will probably move. So that is a problem, but it can be done, and I'm really eager to test it, actually. And you use uh, uh, CAS1 AR in lung? You, mm, yes, it's, yeah. it's really good for lung, as uh, you can do as many planning scans as you want to, because you're going to be able to see the lung tumor without contrast, which is usually the problem for the liver. You have not, you don't have an infinite amount of contrast to give to a patient, but the lung tumors will be visible anyways. So you, it's, it's, I would say it's easier with lungs.